you know, philosophers, right, often talk about, or ethicists often talk about this, uh, what's called the is-ought problem, right? And basically what the is-ought problem is, is something like this. Like, can we get moral prescriptions from simply describing what is the case? Uh, now, philosophers have given various responses to it to say, you know, yes, uh, you can go from what ought to be the, uh, to what ought to be the case from what is the case with respect to aspects of neurobiology and some of the conversations that we're having now, we're uh, engaging in a lot of um, uh, description, right? Description uh, with regard to how the brain works, uh, how we understand these philosophical questions about, um, you know, the will and the choices and inhibition and so on and so forth. And so the question that some philosophers often want to ask is, uh, from where, where does this ought come from, right? So that we ought to serve others. Uh, yes, we can observe that our brains do perhaps uh, express compassion and we move to compassion, but why ought we to do that? Especially if we think we could flourish uh, maybe our own communities or maybe on our own by not treating people compassionately. Uh, so how does this purely descriptive account of human beings get us to these uh, ethical imperatives that uh, Dr. Picard just raised in this last uh, interchange here? Mm -hmm. Reflections here. Yeah, I, I mean, you're in a helping profession, so you know, you're naturally out there doing all these awesome things for people. I come from a profession where I could just kind of sit in my own little world and read papers and write papers and probably never deal with a human being. In fact, I had a student once who said that he really didn't like people. He only liked computers. Uh, and <laughs> when he, um, I had all my students to my house and he came to my house uh, and he said, I want you to know this is my one social event of the year. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, okay, well, I hope, hope you're having a, a good time, you know. <laughs> my, my kids were jumping all over him, you know. Uh, but anyhow, he's a good friend now. And I, um, some of us are, like people here in this room, you know, the fact that you're choosing medicine, you're probably, you know, very outwardly focused toward helping others. But there are a lot of people in the world who, like me, are like strong introverts who would probably be perfectly happy to live in our little world and just take care of ourselves. And it took an imperative in my faith, you know, in reading this to get me to stop being that way, uh, to get me, the girl who flunked show and tell, because I couldn't stand being up in front of people, to be at a place like this tonight. And it's, um, so for some of us, we need something outside of ourselves to tell us to get out of our comfort zone and go treat other people, not, you know, not only as equals, but honor and respect them and think of them more highly than ourselves. Otherwise, we'd just focus on ourselves. So as one of those, and probably very much in the minority in this room, um, I, I find you know, this has made a huge difference in my life. At first, it made me extremely uncomfortable. And now, the relationships, the way it's opened up my world, you know, I would never go back. Um, am I comfortable? No, I'm still nervous. You know, it's still hard. My skin conductance goes through the roof in social settings. But I, um, you know, it's opened my world. It's such a better world. What a blessing. Uh, but uh, let me just, from the standpoint of the brain, try to, to answer that. Uh, first of all, you know, we neuroscientists consider ourselves like philosophers. The difference is philosophers look at their own brain, we look at other people's brain. <laughs> so now, just looking at other people's yeah. brains, um, the brain has been divided into two parts. This dualism has been going on all the time. You know, right side of the brain, left side of the brain is language, right side of the brain is attention, front of the brain is movement, back of the brain is sensation. This type of thing has been going on. But what I was taught by, by my teacher, Norman Gashman, who was a professor here, he uh, said there is also a upper part and a lower part of the brain, which we refer to as dorsal and ventral part of the brain. And the idea of of compassion, et cetera, et cetera, has to do with social interaction, which, which if you want to go become Darwinian about it and go back to the, to the herd, there are the upper part of the brain is responsible evolutionarily for preservation of self. And we know that the upper part, uh, which goes from the back to the front, is feels where you are, and then if you are threatened, it takes off, therefore preservation of self. It's the lower part of the brain, which is referred to as the temporal lobe, but it, that's a misnomer because it's not just temporal lobe, temporal frontal, etc., has to do with preservation of species. 
Preservation of species meaning that the individual in the herd also is responsible for other individual, even the herd that leaves its injured behind, if it sees a threat, makes signals to the rest of the, uh, the herd to, to get off. That responsibility is to the herd. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we look at damage to these parts, we see that. You know, we've seen patients with stroke where they're paralyzed, they can't get, get away, et cetera. When the damage is to the part that has to do with social interactions, then we see a breakdown of the stuff we were talking about sometimes, the breakdown of, uh, say, preservation life, uh, the breakdown of compassion to other people, aggression, et cetera, uh, show up if there is problem with this ventral aspect of our brain. Now, how does that translate into ethics is that is that both of them, both the upper part and the lower part, are excited. And they, they mean we know, now know about the neurotransmitters, we know about the pathways, uh, et cetera. Um, but they, the functions is not that also compartmentalized. You know, and that's why I used to say phrenology hasn't disappeared. Now we call it fMRIology. You know, <laughs> <laughs> phrenologists were looking at the lumps and bumps. These guys are looking at the blood going someplace in the brain. Um, it's really a lot more complex. It is a dynamic, uh, parallel processing, multiple pathways with multiple flexible software that instantaneously changes. Uh, that's why uh, uh, when Snowy was asking me, uh, do you think that uh, artificial intelligence would surpass our brain? I said, not for a million years to come. <laughs> why? Because it still is not that flexible in terms of its software. It still not, doesn't have that creative software that you and I have got right now. So. Um, Yes, we do need uh, a, a system, but we, it can come from a system that's designed to help others. And, uh, and that system can sometimes work better in certain circumstances than the other, but it is there for all of us. We all are members of the herd. We are, are members of the society. That's why we care for each other. And that's why we have to learn to have compassion. That's what we have to learn and, and, and choose a path that, as you've chosen, a path that would make you care, make you uh, love, uh, you know, and just uh, uh, keep forgetting about the Greeks. You know, as a Persian, I have a hard time keep saying the Greeks thought about all of it, but they did. They did. They thought about the four things. It was chaos, earth, and Tartarus, you know, all those horrible thing. But love, eros, was a big thing. And love comes from that part of the brain. And, and uh, that's the purpose, is loving. Mm -hmm.